Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, a doctoral program, and two new online master of arts programs. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This lecture is a part of the 14th Annual Kosciuszko Chair Conference. This conference is sponsored by the Kosciuszko Chair of Polish Studies and the Center for Intermarium Studies. Next, we'll be hearing from Dr. Marek Hodakiewicz. Dr. Hodakiewicz holds the Kosciuszko Chair of Polish Studies at the Institute of World Politics, where he also serves as a professor of history and teaches courses on geography and strategy, contemporary politics and diplomacy, Russian politics and foreign policy, and mass murder prevention in failed and failing states. He's the author of Intermarium, The Land Between the Black and Baltic Seas, and numerous other books and articles. He holds a PhD from Columbia University and has previously taught at the University of Virginia and Loyola Marymount University. Hello, I'm Marek Hodakiewicz. On July 10th, 1941, the Germans, with some local Polish help, mass murdered most Jews of Jedwabne in northeastern Poland. To understand the crime, we have conducted a thorough micro-study of the locality. However, it is also necessary to comprehend a broader historical context. Even before Hitler attacked his erstwhile ally Stalin, the Nazi security forces began to develop a strategic plan which, after June 20th, 1941, culminated in the Holocaust, mass genocide of the Jewish people. The initial thrust of the plan called for three main moves. First, the SS and other German units were to commence exterminating Jewish men under the pretext of fighting pro-Soviet guerrillas. Since the Nazis conflated all Jews with Communism, the mass killing, very soon in, uh, enveloped Jewish women and children as well. Second, because the Germans assumed that the Christian population, Ukrainians, Balts, Poles, and Belarusians, would be anti-Soviet and anti-Jewish, the SS was ordered to provoke surreptitiously the local people to perpetrate violence against their Jewish neighbors. Third, the Nazi police was under strict orders to report the genocide orally only. No written reports were to be generated. This was intended to cover up the crime from the very beginning, in particular the German involvement in it. This Nazi scenario repeated itself on a broad front from the Baltic to the Black Sea. However, Everywhere there were local specifics and peculiarities. For example, one of the principal triggers enraging the local Christians and encouraging them to assist in anti-Jewish crimes was the discovery of thousands upon thousands of prisoners massacred by the Soviets upon their hasty retreat. Thus, in Kaunas, Lvov, and elsewhere, the opening up of prisons with heaps of dead bodies would metastasize into first abuse and then murder of the local Jews. The latter were invariably blamed for communist crimes and were considered Soviet collaborators. However, before, because of the swiftness of the German assault on June 20th, 1941, in the immediate vicinity of the Hitler-Stalin demarcation line, the Soviet occupiers had no time either to evacuate or massacre the prisoners. Hence, most survived. Hence, the factor of bloody revenge for prisoner massacres was missing. That was also the case in Irvavne. The local goal and the county prison in Womja mercifully escaped massacres. To be sure, there was rough justice against local collaborators, both Jews and Christians, in Irvavne. They answered for nearly two years of bloody Soviet occupation 
including the latest round up and mass deportations to the Gulag, which occurred in June 1940, right before Hitler marched in. But the squaring of the accounts against the collaborators took place in the first few days following the flight of the Soviets before the establishment of the German occupation in Yedvabne. It was a fully spontaneous affair, and the Germans were not involved or, for the most part, even present in the little town at that point. The Jewish massacre of July 10, 1941, which occurred two weeks later or more, was an entirely different thing altogether. The Germans engineered and ordered it from above. They carried it out with some local help. Yet it is still unclear to what extent the Christians of Yedvabne were involved in the operation, in particular as far as their role in the killing of their Jewish neighbors is concerned. The evidence strongly suggests that whereas the Poles participated in rounding up the Jews, usually under duress, it was the Germans alone who had the weapons, means, intent, and will to mass murder the Jewish population of Yedvabne. This is a sordid story. The account of the investigation of the crime is unfortunately quite unsettling. The legal instrument to terminate the investigation is a true curiosity. The public prosecutor, Radnosław Ignatiev, produced a monograph-length document. First, he confessed he was unable to find any perpetrators. Then, he claimed confidently that his inability to name anyone guilty, notwithstanding it was the Poles who were responsible for the hideous crime. And then he goes on, on over 200 pages, uh, to state his feelings. Ignatiev's main source of reference was the testimony of Shmuel Wasserstein and the booklet of Jan Thomas Gross, neighbors. Unfortunately for Ignatiev, Wasserstein proved to be a completely unreliable witness. We don't even know if he was in Yedvabne at the moment of the mass murder. And Gross's work turned out to be an exercise in social justice scholarship and an example of critical race theory projected falsely onto Poland. Incidentally, Gross also predicated his baseless tale on Wasserstein's deeply flawed account. This was not the first time that the Holocaust was instrumentalized to trigger a wave of sympathy and emotions to commemorate the greatest tra tragedy of the Jewish people. For example, concurrently to neighbors, Misha de Fonseca published her four memoir. The author claimed that as a seven-year-old Jewish girl in Belgium, she embarked on a quest to find her parents who had been deported to a concentration camp in the East. De Fonseca claimed that as she traveled through Europe, she was assisted in her quest by wolves. The woman assured the readers that she crossed Germany and Poland to reach Ukraine, Zhitomir specifically, and then she returned to Belgium via Romania, Yugoslavia, and Italy with the wolves. Initially, the Fonseca was warmly embraced and sympathized with everywhere in the West. Her story entered school curricula in France and elsewhere. No one questioned the tale for about 10 years. And then it was exposed as a hoax. In Poland, and later throughout the world, the tale spun by Gross became the truth revealed. The nation's intelligentsia was seized by mass hysteria. Hardly anyone questioned the tale. Historians and journalists raced to assign the blame for the Yedvabne massacre to the Poles. The loudest of them proclaimed that if the Poles confessed, they would experience a liberating catharsis. This was straight out of a psychotherapy session, 
and had nothing to do with any scholarship whatsoever, which at any rate was in short supply. But a few intrepid souls dared to ask for proof as well as checking and cross-checking the evidence. Almost immediately, evidence surfaced, undermining the Grossian narrative. The Germans committed the crime and the Poles assisted in it, but the extent of their involvement remained unclear. The courts in Poland established that much already about Yedwabne in the 1940s and 1950s. Over a dozen of local inhabitants were sentenced as accessories to crime and as participants in 1949. Yet, one gathered an impression that following President Kwaśniewski's apology for that allegedly Polish crime, there was a sustained effort to prove that it had actually been so, the facts be damned. However, the evidence shows that the Germans often burned people alive in barns with the assistance of locals, and Yedwabne was just one of such examples of merciless murder. When state prosecutor Ignatiev was winding up his investigation, I wrote a monograph. The massacre in Yedwabne, July 10, 1941, before, during, after, published by East European Monographs, Columbia University Press. My conclusions were quite different from Ignatius. However, I'm not a Polish official, and I was not bound to the statements of President Kwaśniewski, Prime Minister Buzek, or the Chairman of the Institute of National Remembrance, Keres. All of them condemned the Poles for the massacre they never bothered to research. It's obvious that Ignatiev had to tow the bureaucratic line. He could not have disagreed with the most important people in the state, including his immediate superiors. Therefore, Ignatiev felt compelled to accuse the Poles for the crime of Yedwabne. This, in turn, fueled the journalistic narrative in the West, confirming the postmodernist tale purveyed by Gross. Later, the media story was reinforced by scholars, most of whom failed to research it, but instead emoted and regurgitated the dominant narrative. Even if anyone had any doubt because of the lightweight nature of neighbors, now the Polish state, represented by state prosecutor Ignatiev, put everyone's mind at rest. The Poles did it. It became official then. When I wrote my monograph on Yedwabne, I didn't have access to investigative material of Ignatiev. Only a chosen few had, those who agreed with him and Gross. Otherwise, the documents were off-limits, classified and sealed. This was totally dishonest. However, after nearly 20 years, I was able to obtain the investigation records, basing ourselves on them, Eva Stankiewicz, Tomasz Sommer, and I published a second micro-study of the mass murder, Yet Wabne, A True Story. Ours is a brief for defense and an in-depth critique of Ignatiev's thesis. The evidence of the investigation strongly suggests that the role of the Polish population was rather marginal. It was not central to the genocide, Pacha, the popular narrative and punditry. Yet Wabne, a true story, contains a collection of documents with our interpretation of them, about 2,000 pages. We plan to produce an English language monograph to allow non-Polish speakers to familiarize themselves with the evidence and our conclusions. We have not dotted an I, however. Only when the Polish state conducts an exhumation at Yedwabne will we find out the details of the dynamics of the crime and its precise perpetrators. Let's hope it will happen sooner rather than later.